Please join me in our first scripture reading from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Let us begin. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances, that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. At this time, I'd like to invite the kids forward. You coming, Matthew? And Sam's down here. Good morning. Good morning. It's Matthew and Declan, right? And Sam. And some older kids. How are you this morning? Yeah, the older kids is everybody else. Yeah, including me. Yeah, all right. All right, so do you, do you have any routines, things that you do every day, like me in the morning? No? I wake up. You wake up? That's a routine. Yeah. Anything you do? do you, is there something that you do first thing every day? Um, I eat you eat breakfast? Okay. What about, um, what about when you go to bed? Any routines around going to bed? Uh, you read a book? Cool. Any? You listen to music? Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Anything, Matthew? Nope. Okay. So when my kids were little, when they would go to bed, we would say prayers together. And we had this routine where I would ask them, what is one thing that you want to thank God for today? And then they would say something. And then I would say, if there's one thing that if you could have had a do-over on it, what would it be? Right. And then we would say, uh, and then we would say a little prayer together. And we have, and then I'm trying to, and I, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that I, you know, I would say, do you want, do you want to pray or do you want me to pray? And they would always say, we want you to pray. Right. And in my house, because I get to pray a lot in lots of different situations, I say at, when we have dinner, I won't say grace. I make somebody else do it. So guess who ends up doing it every time? My husband. Yeah, because my, cause my kids, they're like, yeah, do you want to do it today? My son, Ben, do you want to do it today? Mm-mm. And that's, you know, and, I, and that would be his answer every day, right? No, no. So we have, we have our little routines that we set up every day, and it kind of gives some, some rhythm. I've, there's different routines that I hear that other people do that, that I like. There are some people... Um, who before they leave their house, they have a little bowl of water 
and they'll dip their fingers in that water and they'll put the sign of the cross on their forehead to remind them that God goes with them. I, I, I like the idea of like even getting out of bed in the morning when you put your feet on the, on the floor to say, you know, I'm getting up because you're with me, right? That could be, I think that would be a really cool routine just to remind, you know, <laughs> to remind yourself and also remind God, hey, we're in this together, right? And to get up. In worship, we have lots of routines, rituals, things that we do every time. We say, you all have, in Sunday school have learned the Lord's Prayer because that's something that we, we say every week in worship. It's that prayer that starts, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Oh, I was, this just occurred to me. I, did, I helped um, officiate at a wedding yesterday, and I did it with a friend, and we were doing the Lord's Prayer. And different churches, they either say, either forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's our version. Other churches say, forgive us our trespasses. And some people say, forgive us our sins. All means the same thing, right? So I've never been where we got to that point and my friend just dropped out. <laughs> and forgive us our... And, I, and, and in those settings, I always go to trespasses because more, more churches say trespasses than, in, than any other. But it was, I've never, and then, so then we're praying and I'm smiling, you know, which was, it was kind of fun because of our different traditions, different rituals. And I'm like, I've never had anybody drop out before. Okay. What we just read in our scripture passage is uh, there is some, something here that our, in Jewish traditions, we were talking about this morning before our friends who are Jewish, right? They have rituals of prayer throughout the day. And what we read today is something that they will pray every day. It's called the Shema. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord above. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And it goes on. But it's a, every day a reminder that we're called to love God with all that we are. Right? And to repeat that to yourself during the day is a good reminder of who we are called to, called to be and how we're called to act in the world, to love God with everything. So I want you to think about, and, and maybe with your, with your parents, think about um, what, are, what are rituals and routines that you can create in your house to, to remind you that God is with you each and every day, whether it's by saying grace or saying a prayer in the morning or saying prayers before you go to bed. But just... and, and you don't need them to do that. You can, you can do it on your own. But it's, you know, those are good things that just remind us that God is and that God is with us. Make sense? And we have a routine, right? When I'm done, when we're done, I say, hold your hands, bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's pray together. So let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the routines, the rituals that remind us that you are, that you are with us, and that we are called to live our lives in love to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture lesson comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power and a po- With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So what this text asks, what this text asks of us is whether we're all in. Are we all in for God? Now, some people cannot hear this passage without, you know, thinking that it advocates Marxism. And I, I have a friend who said she 
uh, preached on this text, and she goes, like, she, they just got stuck on that. It's, and I doubt that the disciples were advocating any kind of uh, uh, economic you know, modality for the, for the Roman Empire. Right? They were just of one heart and of one mind, and as they saw a need, they met the needs. One heart and, what's, and one soul. We, we already heard that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. It's called the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. And again, that, that prayer, it's part of a prayer that is it's a, it's a very important prayer that's repeated throughout the day. Shema Yisrael Adonai Aluheinu Adonai Echad. I had a, when I was taking Hebrew in seminary, our, my teaching assistant said, since we're, since we're doing this gathering around scripture, we started every class by reciting the Shema together in Hebrew. Goes on to say, keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And we've seen this, there, the, the traditions where the rabbi will have a little box on their, on their forehead with um, pieces of the, of the Torah in, in it, very literal, right? But they will lead worship with those boxes or the mezuzah on, that is kept on the doorposts of our uh, fr- brothers and sisters who are Jewish in their homes, uh, again, a fragment of the Torah there, to taking this passage very literally. Be of one heart and one soul. And they did give of their excess to, to those who had need, which is, again, an allusion to De- Deuteronomy 15, verse 4, which paints a picture of the promised land, what the promised land is going to look like. There will, however, be no one in need among you because the Lord is sure to bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as as a possession to occupy. So when people heard this, the people who were reading this, they were thinking, wow, Jesus has brought in the kingdom of God. This This is what was promised is actually happening. Now, did they did they sell everything they owned? Probably not. Did they sell the roofs over their house, of, over their heads? We know that they gathered in houses, so probably not. It's more likely that they sold the more than enough. There's enough, and then there's the more than enough. That's probably what they sold, the more than enough stuff, the excess. But it boiled down to this. What they had, they put in service to God. When we talk about stewardship of our times, our talents, our treasures, yeah, and you might be thinking, is this stewardship season? Uh-uh. You know, no and yes, because it's always stewardship season. Uh, because we're called to use all that we are to be all in for God. I recently preached a sermon on call. And if, if you'll remember, Barbara Brown Taylor, an Episcopal priest, where she settled on call is if you are using your gifts, then you are fulfilling your call. Some people would argue with her with that, but it's a good question to ask ourselves, are we using the gifts that God has given us? Are we have been blessed? How are we using the blessings that God has given us? In the listening groups that you are, have, uh, encouraged to attend this month and may, and may I encourage you to, again, I said this, this before as a joke, please open your emails. On Friday, for the last several weeks, you have been received an invitation to join a listening group where the discernment team is listening to you. Uh, you've been given a, a summary of a demographic report to read, a summary of the timeline, a storytelling event, and to be praying about how God is calling Grace Presbyterian Church to be in ministry to the community. And what are the gifts and the talents that you are bringing and laying before the the church to be in service to the church and to the larger community? And that's, the listening groups are about listening to that. And it's more than just that, but that's, that's part of it. How, you know, how can you imagine, how do you, how is God whispering in your ear to be using your gifts in service to the church? It could be administration, hospitality. Do you have a passion for kids or for senior citizens, for the environment? 
do you love scripture and are willing to gather a group of folks to gather around and and learn uh, and grow closer to God and one another by gathering around scripture? Are you itching to feed folks who are who are food insecure? Let us know what are the gifts and passions that you have been blessed and burdened to share. I read an article that it boils down to that the core of stewardship is love. And I don't think you can frame it any better than that. Our love for God calls us into service. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Love makes us generous givers. What is mine is yours. Now, this is a crowd that I think will know the answer to this. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Who wrote that? See, I knew it. I knew it. This congregation would know it. Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote that. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. Sonnet number 43. If you want to know where your heart is, count the ways. Look at your calendar. That'll tell you what, how you, you know, what, what you prioritize your time, how you prioritize your time. Look at your credit card bill or your bank account. It'll tell you what your priorities are. We learn about the heart of the apostles. People were bringing money to them, laying it at their feet. They were not in it for the money. They gave it away. It was distributed to any as had need. And we learn in this passage that great grace was upon them all. Grace comes from God. And we have previously learned that they had the favor of all the people. Here we read, and God's favor was upon them as well. And we're also introduced to the character named Barnabas, who was a major player in Acts, uh, who is later referred to as an apostle. Apostle means to be sent out on a mission, and he was. We first read that his name was Joe or Joseph and that they, rena- that they renamed him Barnabas, son of encouragement. What's funny is that that might not be what Barnabas means. We're not sure, the translation of Barnabas. Barnabas. But he has an interesting role uh, fitting into that description. He had the respect of Peter and John and Jesus' uh, original disciples. And you know, then this outsider, Paul, comes in, who is Saul, you know, who persecuted the Christians and suddenly is a convert, and they are distrustful of him. Barnabas is the one who says, no, he's okay. He's a good guy. And he was kind of the bridge for, with Paul and the original disciples. Barnabas would later travel with Paul in his ministry to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. They split at one point because Barnabas wanted his cousin Mark to come with them, and Paul said no, because Mark had left the mission field at one point, and so Paul didn't trust him. He later came to realize that he was wrong, and I think it's fascinating because I I love scripture because of the humanity of the people, who God has to work with. Paul didn't like Mark because he turned back, and you're like, this is Paul, who was Saul, who persecuted the Christians, who had a change of heart, who doesn't, you know, who, who is non-forgiving and then realizes later that he's wrong. And he had been too judgmental. So when we are beating ourselves up, don't beat yourself up. But acknowledge that we, do, we fall short of the glory of God. And, some t- you know, and in scripture we read about Paul and David and Moses and Abraham and Sarah and Adam and Eve and all the folks who, very human, their story is our story. And I, I was like, we're all that God has to work with. So we, all, we don't always get it right, and we can be hypocritical, and it's good to acknowledge that. But when we recognize that we've made a mistake to own it, it's our custom to confess, to receive for forgiveness and repent, which again, which means to try to do better. There is forgiveness in Scripture, but there's also this high bar for which we are grateful. Scripture calls us to be all in. God calls us to be all in. So rather than rather than beat ourselves up for the ways that we don't, <laughs> let us encourage ourselves to be generous with the love of God in all that we do. Shema Yisrael.
The Lord is one. Let us be one in spirit, the spirit of love and generosity. In Jesus' name, amen.